Welcome to the Chasing Gold Olympics podcast. I'm your host, Muck Bill Yabro, joined by my co-host, Mike Hove. Mike, what's going on, what's my man? Bro? You good? Yes, man. I'm good. I'm good, man. How you feeling? Man, this feels exciting. We're back here week two. We're back at it again, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, we had a conversation with uh, track and field Olympian Abdi Hamid Noor. Uh, he's a Somali-American and will be taking part in the 5,000-meter uh, Olympic race, mm -hmm. which is going to be a phenomenal race. Uh, it's the first Somali that will be uh, doing this, uh, mm -hmm. partaking in this in, in this. Um, um, the race. In mm -hmm. the race, basically. Uh, he touched on his inspiration uh, in the sport and wanting to be a role model for young Somalis uh, wanting to make it. Uh, let's take a listen. Yeah, so I started running um, freshman, uh, sorry, junior year of high school. Um, I was a soccer player before that. Um, I come from a big family. I have three older brothers and three older sisters and one younger sister. And all my brothers played soccer. So that was my first love growing up. Um, but right around junior year of high school, um, I was I was uh, coming back from an injury um, and soccer. I mean, running was one of those things they recommended for me to um, uh, speed up the rehab process and to get back on the field quicker. So I kind of just picked it up just to help me with my conditioning throughout soccer. And it was something that I just ended up being really good at. And um, I was lucky enough that my soccer coach was the cross country coach at my high school. So it wasn't a crazy transition, but it was um, it was fun for me because he made it fun. It was uh place that all the soccer guys came together to get conditioning and to improve on uh, their soccer fitness and that was somewhere that's how I started uh, running but um, it just took off and um, sitting here like even you introduced me as Olympian it kind of sounds crazy and taking me back to that moment when we first started so yeah junior of high school is when I first started um, running and got into it. Well, you, you're a Somali American you know um, it's interesting to see Somalis sometimes depicted in a certain light uh, globally. What do you think this means for maybe uh, younger runners coming up and seeing, you know, maybe like the likes of a Mo Farah and yeah. seeing somebody like you now uh, being able to compete on the biggest stage? Uh, do you put those things into your mind as well uh, when you're competing? Yeah, for sure, man. Like um, you speaking about one of the legends, Mo Farah, is like watching him do it at the Olympic stage and watching him win four Olympic gold medals. And it's like someone that you can look and like see resemblance and be like, yeah, that's a Somali. And that's a, that's someone that like re represents me and looks like me. It gives you motivation and inspiration to be like, man, I, that's something I can do. And he was someone I looked up to and like, you know, it was like, like, I was like, man, if, if he's doing it at the highest level and winning gold, like, I can do this and um, where I went to university, I went to Northern Arizona University. I graduated and competed there. Um, we trained at 7,000 feet. Also the town is Flagstaff, Arizona. And um, when I was in college, Mo would come there and train in town. And I built a friendship with him. I built a relationship with him and I was so grateful. And, you know, meeting him, it was a little scary because you never know when you're meeting your idols, right? But meeting him was like amazing because he was so down to earth, so humble, so easygoing. And, he kind of took me underneath his wing and was like, hey, man, like, you got you got something special. Just stay focused, stay locked in, and always told me to pass it on to the next generation because, like, I'm in the position now that I'm representing America and one of the top runners in America, and being Somali, it's like all the little youngins are looking at me and be like, yo, I want to be just like that. So it's like what I learned from him, I try to bring it on to the youngers that are watching me and inspiring me. But it's special. It's so special seeing someone that looks like you from the ba same background as you doing things at the highest stage and it gives you inspiration. So yeah, I definitely um, use my um, background as being a Somali and being an uh, African-American um, to inspire and show love to all the young athletes coming up. Absolutely. No, representation matters, bro. So I, I definitely, I can definitely uh, see that. Now, Paris 2024. Uh, what are your hopes? What are your aspirations? Uh, and what are you feeling like uh, as you are in a training camp, I presume now, right before uh, uh, the Olympics kick off for you? I'm excited, man. I'm so excited. You know, I've made um, this is my third U.S. team making it. Um, but the two past ones were world championships, so they weren't as um, high a level as the Olympics. Um, being an Olympian and um, representing Team USA is something really special because it's the highest stage and 
it's just crazy every time i just think the olympian is i still has it has, still hasn't sunk in but it's so special and i'm so excited to uh, for the opportunity to compete with the best in the world um i think my chances are um best as anybody else you know i'm a young athlete and i have experience now and um just been here a few times so i'm excited to um show my fitness show my hunger and just compete for a spot to medal and bring uh silverware home that was Olympian Abdelhamid Noor speaking to me from France as he prepares for the Olympics. Mike. Yes, man. Let, 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 let's talk about my man Abdelhamid Noor. Mm -hmm. You know, what a story. Young man comes from Somalia. His family, you know, uh, are refugees. Mm -hmm. they, they have to find their way to, to make it to America. And then not only does he do that, but he then partakes in a race that usually is not the, the it's U.S. Not is, is, is right. not a very mm -hmm. dominant uh, race for the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, usually mm -hmm. we dominate in 100 meters, 200 meters, right. which, which, which we'll, we'll discuss shortly. You know? <laughs> right, we're about uh, to get to it. Right, right, right. But for him, what do you think, like I asked him basically, what does it mean for him um, to be that face for the new up and coming, not mm -hmm. only Somali Americans, but all, you know, uh, all African Americans yeah. uh, uh, in the country and globally mm -hmm. to be able to uh, be a face that looks like them, to represent mm -hmm. any specific mm -hmm. race like that. What do, you, what do you think that means? I mean, Look, he, he did highlight how important it is. Uh, I like the fact that you guys roped in Mo Farah as an example, right? Because right. he's one person who, for lack of a better word, I'll call him a torchbearer. Uh, mm -hmm. He represented a dynamic or a demographic that was existent within the country but wasn't propelled to that extent. And so I think seeing what he's doing, that's kind. I, I kind of liken it to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, he's not a Mo Farah yet. Mo Farah has dozens yeah, and dozens yeah, yeah. of uh, gold medals. Right, right. Uh, but the fact that he's becoming that torch bear and opening uh, up America mm -hmm. to an entire new demographic mm -hmm. that is not only beneficial to Somalis, but mm -hmm. is also beneficial. I mean, the population of Somali Americans is very big. Mm -hmm. So he's becoming a torchbearer and opening up doors for so many Somali Americans. You, you know, the, the, the long distance runner is yeah. not just dominant by Somalis, but yeah. we now have Kenyan Americans oh, who can right. aspire for the same, Ethiopian right. Americans who can aspire for the same. Mm -hmm. Not just them, but any African American can mm -hmm. aspire to now have that representation. And so what he's doing is really, uh, uh, it's pivotal. It's really yeah. important for that race. Yeah. Awesome, man. Uh, definitely, uh, we will be touching up on uh, yeah. the 100 meters, the oh, 200 yeah. meters. Oh, yeah, uh, of course. This is really exciting. Um, but now, speaking, of course, uh, about runners, uh, we're about to give you a start by U.S. sprinter Noah Lyles. Now, he just recently positioned himself as a strong candidate to win the Olympic double in the both the 100 meter and, of course, the 200 meter race. Now, after he came first in the Diamond League Games this weekend, uh, these were held in London, of course. Uh, Noah Lyles set a personal best after clocking a uh, 9.81 a second in a, a, the 100 meter race. Uh, now, he was racing against uh, medal winning athletes, including of Botswana's Let's See Let Tavojo and of course Britain's Jarnel Hughes. Now last week here on Chasing Gold, Mark Bill and I touched on Noah Lyle's personality as an athlete and his goal which is to become the person who is bigger than the sport, a person bigger than uh, track and field. He wants to become a personality who brings more attention uh, to track and field as a sport. Now, in an interview with Reuters, uh, Lyle's uh, doubled down on the, those sentiments, and of course, he addressed some athletes and critics. Let's take a look. I mean, you can't expect everybody to love what you do. Um, it's funny, I'll, I'll give an example. There is an athlete who is kind of known for disliking me. I'm not sure if he's joking or serious, but every time he create, every time I do something, he creates a TikTok. Now, I don't truly have a problem with this because in my head, I see this just you know, publicity. And every time I do something, he enhances it. Whether you like it or not, you're still talking about it. So I'm not willing to block somebody unless they're directly trying to harm me. I can easily just mute them and they let them go about their business. Because I mean, I don't have to look at it. You know, I can only do my job and what I believe is good for sport. And I think that's a personality. I mean, I can't, I can't tell you how many comments and people have come up to me and saying like, I didn't even care about the four by four to you and to you. And I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> that proves that a personality is needed to help, you know, push it along. You know, of course the sport is interesting in itself, but it, you know, people need stories to connect with. And I love telling stories through my career. 
So I, I feel the more the merrier in that when it comes to other athletes, but of course you can't force anybody. And I have dealt with people in the track world who have, you know, tried to, you know, help me tell sport stories. Um, Celsius is being included in that. They are, you know, trying to help me tell a different side of the story and, you know, be able to reach new audiences. That was U.S. sprinter Noah Laos talking to Reuters about his ambitions to transform and, of course, uplift the sport, track and field as a sport here in the United States. Uh, now, Mugbill, of course, at the Olympics here, we're talking about Noah Lyles. He's not the only person who's going up. Uh, you know, we're seeing so many different young athletes, Africans included. Uh, here we're talking about the fastest man in Britain, Jarnel uh, Hughes, set a world record. We're also going to include Abotswana's Letile Tevojo. He's another man who's been a thorn uh, in Noah Lyles' back. And then, of course, we're going to talk about Kenya's Ferdinand Omanyala, the fastest man in Africa. Uh, surely we're going to expect so many good things about these guys. And of course, we're going to talk about fireworks, fireworks when we're looking at the Olympics, man. Come on, man. All of those guys are exactly what you mentioned. But let's talk about the women for a quick second. Shakari Richardson has somewhat of a redemption arc that she's working on right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, media hasn't really been that great to her, mm -hmm. um, but she is just a young woman just trying to maneuver you know, media while still having all the lights on her. Mm -hmm. She's expected to win the 100 meters this year yeah. for the US. The 100 meters has been a staple for um, has been a staple for Jamaica for the past, uh, I would say two, maybe three Olympics. Um, so for me, when I'm looking at it, I'm seeing Shakari Richardson. She's looking like the favorite at the moment for the 100 meters. Um, you have Sharika Jackson for Jamaica, who obviously is in contention for both the 100 meters and the 200 meters. Um, and then you have the legendary Shelly Ann Frazier Price, who is definitely going to be, uh, you know, doing her thing. But yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead, my man. Yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be really exciting to see uh, all these stories come out to play. Uh, some of these are, they're not Olympic rivalries, but they're rivalries in the brewing. We've seen Shakari time and time again, uh, you know, set her stone or set her place. Uh, and this, I think, will be very pivotal for her to set her stone in history uh, and become... Shakari Richardson, uh, you know, being the person in the history books, win her first gold, uh, gold Olympic medal. So this is going to be exciting to see as, of course, we pay attention more on what's happening in uh, France and Paris. Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're joining us right now, uh, you are still tuned uh, to Chasing Gold Olympics 2024. Now, this is VOA's podcast focus on the Paris Olympics. But before we continue our conversations, we're going to be taking a breather. Uh, and, of course, we're going to showcase some of VOA's amazing products. Uh, but when we come back... We're going to be talking a lot more about the Olympics. We're going to be unpacking the face-off uh, between South Sudan and the UN's men's basketball team. And, of course, we're going to be talking soccer Olympics. So let's take a break, and we'll be right back. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. You're watching VOA's Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Vungani. Thank you so much for joining us each week right here on Red Carpet. We bring you the latest in... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you are still paying attention to Chasing Gold Olympics 2024. I'm your host, Mike Horvath, and of course, I'm in studio with my guy, <clears throat> Mark Bill Yabro. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk basketball. Swiss. Yes. Oh, the chat that the world has been waiting for. We just saw history. Uh, we just saw South Sudan standing up. And, of course, the world is still speaking. You know, before we jump into it, absolutely, we, we have a, uh, 
package that we will be going into. But right before we get into it, man, South Sudan, what mm -hmm. an amazing, amazing story. Before the Olympics even starts, letting the world know we are on notice. We're letting you know that, hey, you might not know about South Sudan. But trust me, we're here. And By the time I, France is over, they oh, will know. You will absolutely know because we've had historical figures when it pertains to the game of basketball that have always been in mm -hmm. uh, the NBA and higher levels of basketball. It's just that the collective yeah. team and the country hasn't had the infrastructure needed to build from the, the country. So we'll, we'll dive into that, though. Yeah, man. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, speaking, of course, of the game, uh, you, as we mentioned, there were pros and cons to South Sudan playing an exceptional game against the U.S. men's basketball team. Uh, we saw the East African athletes being praised by pandits across the world. Now, some were expecting them to win medals uh, at the Olympics in Paris. Uh, with that in mind, let's take a look at this file I prepared, which details more on South Sudan and Paris. <laughs> Basketball officials and commentators across the world took to social media over the weekend to applaud South Sudan's bright stars. The team lost to the U.S. men's national basketball team by just one point on Saturday. The final score in their last exhibition match ahead of the Paris Olympics was Team U.S. 101 and South Sudan 100. This is the first time a South Sudan team has qualified for the Olympics. In a press statement after the game, South Sudan's head coach, Royal Ivy, a former NBA player, applauded his team for showing resilience. Steve Kerr, Ivy's U.S. counterpart, said the exhibition games played against Serbia, Canada, and South Sudan were tough, but also good preparations for the Olympic Games. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We wanted good competition, and um, you know we've played obviously uh, some tough teams um, already, and um, it's good preparation for us. Experts say Saturday's game was of great significance for the Bright Stars because they managed to compete against a star-studded U.S. team. The American team includes Steph Curry, a multiple award-winning athlete, and LeBron James, a three-time Olympic medalist, and the NBA's highest point scorer of all time with 40,474 points throughout his 21-year career. James was a saving grace for the U.S. in the game against South Sudan by scoring a layup in the last seconds. In a video published on the NBA's X account, James is captured expressing appreciation for a close game against the Bright Stars. I'm going to be honest, I like those is better than the blowouts. At least we get tested. I like getting tested, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you just uh, saw that, uh, of course, Swiss, uh, LeBron James, Steph Curry, uh, everybody, they showed appreciation for the South Sudanese team. You heard LeBron there. Right. I like those better than the blowouts. I like right. to be tested. Right, right. Shows how South Sudan performed in that game. Right. I mean, it also goes to show you that, look, this is a team that, you know, plays at the highest levels yeah. across the world, course, right? You, you have players like Wenyan Gabriel, who mm -hmm. have played in the NBA for six plus years. Yeah. You have, like we mentioned, the Nuno Mats, right? Mm -hmm. BAL and playing in Europe across mm -hmm. the board. We have so many players on that South Sudan team, as well as being led by Luol Deng, you of know, course. an all-star, NBA all-star, you know, played for Chicago Bulls mm -hmm. and, and, and had a really long a career in the NBA. So it's not anything amazing to me. And I'm looking at it like the South Sudanese team, they have the belief that they can go up against anybody because we, we are of that higher quality. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like we are just a bunch of, you know, non-pros that just have to magically come together and then we're expecting to lay down. Yeah. Uh, I think it really did what it was supposed to do, that initial game against the U.S., because we're looking at this team as, like we mentioned, Dream Team 2.0, just, right. just from the caliber of the players that mm -hmm. are on this team. So shout out to South Sudan for letting people know before the competition even really starts, right? They, they about we're that time. here. So when we end up going up against and playing Puerto Rico mm -hmm. in our first game, Puerto Rico better be ready because oh, we course. are going to be ready. So I, I love it. I mean, it's, it's really exciting to see... Um, a, a first-time Olympic team coming together. Uh, of course, once again, as we've all, all we mentioned this last week, and it's something to reiterate: uh, these are not amateur players. These are players who play at the best level across the world. They're right. playing in Australia. They're playing yeah. at the BAL. Mm -hmm. They're playing in the NBA. They play in the G League. Right. So these are all A-list players, right. Right? right? And so, to a certain extent, I'm pretty sure some of them have probably come across LeBron James and all that <laughs> at some point in their career. So, uh, for me, what really interested me and amused me was to see the pundits' reaction to yeah. see how a some people really didn't take it seriously mm -hmm. up until the last minute because right. at some point in the game South Sudan was really up up 
South Sudan was <laughs> up by 14 points. At like, some point at in half, the day, you right. Know? Yeah. And, and so for me, it was really exciting to see a, an inspirational story. Everybody loves that inspirational story. Right. Uh, B, to see the overwhelming support that the world, the basketball world across the whole world yeah. decided, you know what, let's actually pay more attention to this. This right. unpacks a whole different layer because by God's grace, should they win a gold medal right. or a silver or medal, medal or, or medal. Uh, any right, medal, right, right. I think the amount of attention it gives to basketball in South Sudan yeah. and basketball in Africa right. is a whole different layer, that an attention yeah. that the world should be ready for. Right. Uh, once again, it's something that we applaud for these different leagues that are paying more attention to Africa mm -hmm. before we even get to the Olympics, right? right so we right. have, for example, the NBA, right. who's investing more in the Basketball Africa League. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing all these different FIBA uh, you know, competitions that are being held on the, com uh, on the continent. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, once again, uh, South Sudan has pressure because mm -hmm. the whole continent is looking at them like, hey, yeah. you got a champion for us. But at the right. same time, it seems as though a lot of these players are ready for that pressure. Yeah, it kind of gives me the same vibe as, you know, that Morocco team, right, for the World at Cup. At the World right? Cup, exactly. So, you know, when you just have one representative, you know, for the entire continent, mm -hmm. Everybody wanna, wants to come around and support that. But it's not only the continent of Africa. Right. Every small nation or smaller country or a country that, you know, it's almost like a David and Goliath story, yes, right? You're yes, going yes. up against the, the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. You know, in that exhibition game. And for you to be able to understand, look, between these lines, right, between these four lines, we are all equal. Yes. You know, the quality of the players might, you know, you might know names. Of course, LeBron James, one of the greatest of all of time. Of all time, But yeah. it doesn't mean that you can't beat him mm -hmm. in one specific mm -hmm. day. And that's mm -hmm. the beauty of, you know, tournaments like this, right? Yeah. It's not like an NBA ch series no. where you have to beat a team four times. I just need you for a quarter. I, I, just, I just need you for four quarters. <laughs> put it together, <laughs> I, I, and I just need you just today. Right. You know, as long right, as I get right. you for today, I'm good. that's it. Yeah, I don't have yeah, to ever yeah. beat you again. I don't mm -hmm. have to put this performance together again yeah. but as long as i know within this one day we're coming out and we're doing what we can um it, it's an amazing thing you mentioned the bal mm -hmm. the nba partnering with them the level of attention that not only basketball but sports in general is starting to get uh, on the continent of africa shows us that man the continent of africa is only on the rise it's so, only on the rise beautiful. but you know what i loved how you 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 made that synonymous comparison right because yeah. even with morocco morocco yeah. knocked out the big bad portugal right roof, right right, right, right. <laughs> not to call them that but right. that was it is that right. it was a david and goliath story right. to see morocco be the team that knocked them out right. it was something that people hailed and so to see south sudan once again to make that comparison in basketball mm -hmm. now be the team that raises up to america I remember before the game, a lot of pundits were saying, nah, this yeah. is going to be an easy blowout, right? right? And right. bear in mind, this is off the U.S. team playing really well in their first game. Of right. course, they played uh, average Aust Australia. against, uh, they played Austra Australia, yeah. and then very average against Canada. Yeah. But they were looking at South Sudan as, ah, this might be an easy exhibition match. Right. So to see them really be tested is something mm -hmm. to be applauded. And it's also spoken well to the confidence that South Sudan is having right. as they step into this. I mean, uh, we've, we've heard several different players talk on this, how mm -hmm. some of these guys are like you know what this is a beauty, beautiful quote-unquote refugee story right right because the, the infrastructure that they have in the lead, separate leagues that they play at yeah versus the infrastructure at home those are two different talent right. stories at right. home they right. don't have arenas they don't have right. all that right. yes they've got courts here and there yeah. but it's not the up standard that they'll be playing at in France and that's the point the, mm -hmm. the main story here is these players wanting to highlight their country and being being able to showcase look we have players of that capability, right? When and Gabriel mentioned a seven footer, you yeah. know, that is a shepherd yeah. right? back home yeah. in one of his villages, you know, it just goes to show you what could that kid do with the sport of basketball mm -hmm. if the infrastructure was there. Yeah. And that's all they're trying to do here. They're not here asking for pity. They're not out here doing, you know, too much. They just want to let you know we are here, we're professionals, we're here to play, but we're also here to highlight the greater story. And I also like the fact that the U.S. team, players like LeBron James and stuff, mm -hmm. came out and said, yeah, these are the type of games that we like too because this also makes sure that we're on our A game. Yes. We yes. cannot take for granted a name you know, like a South Sudan because maybe we are not that familiar with all of the players. We mm -hmm. may know one or two. We may know the coaching staff and the players that, you know, have reached the pinnacle, but we might not be familiar with everybody, but we still have to come at it with a level of, you know, determination, professionalism, and in order to win in basketball, 
um, you know, on a global scale in 2024, Mike, is different than how it was in the 90s in oh, the Dream big, Team. Big the game has developed so much more mm -hmm. that you can't take for granted anybody that is competing of in these course. competitions. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we're about to wrap up Swiss, uh, but to quickly touch on, we're also going to have the Soccer Olympics. Yes, we will have the Soccer Olympics. We have uh, four African nations that will be partaking in them. Yes. That'll be Morocco. That'll be Egypt, we have Mali, and and I believe we have Guinea? Yes, Guinea, yeah, Guinea, yeah, Guinea. Yep, yes. Guinea. Speaking of Olympic soccer, uh, we have with us online Coach Sam Sasu joining us from Tanzania. <laughs> Coach, what's going on, my man? What's going on? Sam Sasu! Hey, how are you guys doing? How's everybody doing? Beautiful, man. Beautiful. How are you doing? I'm um, doing fantastic. Loving the weather here in Tanzania, so. Absolutely. Talking about the continent, man. Talk to us about uh, some of the African teams that are uh, going to be partaking in the Olympic soccer this year. We have Morocco, Guinea, mm -hmm. Egypt, and Mali. One in each group. Who do you think has the best chances? Coach. Oh, man. This is, uh, first off, I want to say thank you all for hosting me. Uh, I know it's a bit of short notice, but I'm glad to be here, so. Uh, speaking of the teams, um, you kind of have to kind of go with, you know, obviously the big names. you got to talk about Morocco, right? So Morocco coming into this tournament, you know how well they did during uh, AFCON and how well uh, you saw them push throughout different uh, matches throughout the tournament. You saw how Hakimi made a big difference when he was playing, right? Um, when we talk about Egypt, uh, it, it's going to be a fair game in their group. Uh, I didn't have enough time to analyze the particular group stages for Egypt, but when looking at how they've been playing over the last couple of months, uh, you can definitely see the cohesion of the team. You can kind of see how they're actually willing to play with each other. Uh, but the biggest thing is they have a drive because they have something to prove coming into this tournament. Based off of how they performed in AFCON, uh, they didn't reach to the standards of what all the spectators or all the believers thought in that timing. So uh, those are my two big, big hitters coming out of the tournaments, uh, at least for the Olympics. Uh, we're seeing several different uh, big teams, uh, France, United States, uh, they're also going to be featuring alongside uh, these African teams. Uh, talk to me about how you feel Africa will perform up against these big names, man. Well, generally, generally speaking, uh, if you're looking on paper, a lot of people will not rule in any of the African countries to perform well. But I think overall in the past, let's say, five years or so, most African teams have really been stepping up in major tournaments. Mm -hmm. um, you saw how well majority of the underdog African teams performed uh, during AFCON. You know, uh, you saw it how, you know, South Africa, Bafana, Bafana, Amen. from right there, uh, how, well they, <laughs> how well they performed uh, and, and somewhat broke hearts towards the end. Um, but overall, you know, the, the France side of things, the, the United States side of things, the African teams nowadays have quality. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking quality, it, it's due to a number of things. So let's just touch on the first two things. First thing is that a lot of these African players are now playing at top clubs, whether it's in La Liga, mm -hmm. Ligue 1, or if it's playing in the Premier League. They're playing great football. So mm -hmm. now they're picking up you know, the aspects of technique. They're picking up the aspects of understanding position and timing. And the biggest thing that these teams are doing they're allowing these African players to kind of get a better experience when they're playing at those clubs, right? The second thing is, it's the confidence. A lot of African players are playing with a lot more confidence than what you used to see, let's say, 10 to 15 years ago. Sam, you know, Sam, Sam. Obviously, back then. We're going to have to hold you, bro. Yes. And, but I, I guarantee you, ah. listen, we're talking more about soccer next week, but we're going to bring you back and have you uh, talk to us more. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Sam Sasu, uh, one of uh, the coaches. Sam, thank you so much. Mikey, it's always a pleasure. You know how it is. Bro, it's, time flies when you're having fun. It's so much easier to, you know, continue this. But unfortunately, we are out of time. This has been an amazing episode of Chasing Gold. Olympics 2024. 24, Mikey, always a pleasure, my brother. Until next time, peace. <laughs>